Hi everybody, David here from VR Render. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Normally in these videos, I'm telling you what you can do or should do or might want to do when it comes to architectural rendering. In this video, I want to talk about the top five mistakes that I see my students make. And these are mistakes that I think a lot of people who are just starting out in architectural rendering or architectural visualization are probably going to be prone to make. I've been teaching ArcViz for between about five or six years now, and I tend to see students make the same mistakes over and over again, particularly when they start out. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about the top five mistakes that I see students make, and hopefully they can help you guys to not make the same mistakes yourselves. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so the first tip pertains to materials. Before we get into that though, let's take a quick look. We've got a basic SketchUp scene here, nothing too crazy, going for sort of a um, modern Wayne Scott luxury looking build, nothing too particularly complicated about this. Let's look at this in D5. And you can see this is very similar to what starting out students tend to do. And there are a number of cardinal material mistakes that new users, and this applies to D5, to Twinmotion, Lumion, Enscape, pretty much any architectural rendering software, and it comes down to materials. So there are three main mistakes that I wanna cover, but at heart with all of them comes down to just an inaccurate understanding of how things are actually constructed or how materials actually work. Okay, so let's look first at the walls. Often one of the projects I'll do with my students is a sort of high-end luxury build. And if you look up any pictures of high-end luxury builds, you're gonna see marble. And as such, that translates often into the idea of, hey, let's put marble on every surface. Now, there is a place for this, for like having high-end marble surfaces, but I often see students try and put marble on the walls, which is something that you kind of generally want to avoid. Let's try and limit the use of luxury materials to specific elements within your build, and the walls is not one of them. The second common misunderstanding is in the use of textured materials. For example, I've noticed my students go, well, this material here should be wood. So what I'll do is I'll just pull up the wood material and I'll go ahead and just apply something that I think looks kind of right, but isn't necessarily. So basically they say, okay, this surface is wood. I will find a wood material and just go ahead and apply it, which is not necessarily the right way to approach this. Um, materials like in D5 are quite heavily textured. You wanna be very careful that when you're applying a wood material to be mindful of the grain and the underlying texture. And you can see that right here. Now, the third mistake comes to do with tiling and material scale. You can see there's a tiled material on the floor here, but if I click on it, you can see that it, the scale is really inaccurate. This material has been stretched. And oftentimes I see students will either stretch out a material to make it either too large or they'll have a tiling too much. And either way, you sort of hurt the overall look of your image. You have to be kind of mindful of how big the actual textured materials are. A good habit in D5 is to make sure that a material is set either to one or I find sometimes putting it to two. And that's a good default for a lot of your materials. Okay, so how do we go about fixing these material mistakes? The first thing you wanna do is reference and then try and dial back some of the sort of steps towards luxury. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, let's go ahead and replace this wood material with something a little bit more realistic. So I've got some materials that I've set up over here on the side. I'm gonna go ahead and just sample and this is just the default paint material. This is, I believe, just sort of the rough paint material. And I think that looks pretty good for our decorative elements. Getting rid of the marble, let's go ahead and again, I've sampled from just a default paint material. And I'm gonna go ahead and apply that to my back wall here. And what I'm also gonna do is we can pull up the materials palette. I'm gonna go to my favorites. 
And I've got just the regular white wall paint here. I'm gonna apply that to these walls here. And I think all in all, that looks pretty nice. I think I'm gonna go ahead and tweak the color of this back wall. Um, this kind of teal look is really nice. I, I think teal is a really good color, especially when it comes to working with white. Yeah, that's looking a little bit better already. And lastly, the floor material. Yes, it's nice to have um, kind of a tile effect going on, but we just wanna be kind of, kind of cognizant of what we're actually putting on there. All right, I'm gonna grab one of these tile materials and I'm just gonna assign it. I'm gonna check the scale. That looks pretty good. Already, this room is starting to look a little bit better. And that, that's really just comes down to changing three materials to something that is a little more feasible. And yeah, we've got kind of this luxury reflective material, but it's limited in its use. I'm also gonna go ahead and just change this random metal material that would be assigned. These are basically just lights that came in from SketchUp. And I'm gonna go ahead and just select this material. I'm gonna go ahead and just change it to something a little bit more brass. This mirror brass will work pretty good. All right, okay, so that should cover basically material mistakes starting off. Let's go ahead and bounce into common mistake number two. Okay, so the second big mistake that I see a lot with my students, and, and this is probably in many ways, probably the most important uh, of the tips that I wanna talk about. And it's to do with one simple thing that is often really, really neglected uh, in students early on. And it is this, this is the dreaded horizon line. Quite simply, there is nothing that will ruin your render and your design, your build, your visualization, quite like seeing the horizon line in your shot. And what I wanna talk about is a couple of ways that you can actually go ahead and hide that. Now, this is one of those things that's really easy to overlook and is surprisingly hard to fix in post-production. You can, to a limited degree, get away with painting bright white light out in your windows in Photoshop, but it is, um, in my experience, it, it is seriously a pain. And depending on how large the windows in your actual shot, you may find that you end up having to really, really do a heavy, heavy paint over. And that's really easy to avoid. Okay, so how do we hide the horizon line? All right, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. You can do this in D5 or Lumion or Twinmotion, your rendering engine of choice, doesn't really matter. There are a couple of ways to do it. If you wanna do it in a fast way in D5, one way you can do that is to go ahead and on a separate layer, you can see over here on the left, foliage, I've gone ahead and placed a bunch of plants and trees. Close to the camera and close to the window, we have basically shrubbery. This will give the impression that basically there's a garden outside of the window, or at least that there's an area of green space. You do wanna be really mindful that your shrubbery is reasonably scaled and you shouldn't make the shrubbery and greenery outside your window so dense that it looks like your interior shot happens to be set in like a jungle environment or something along those lines. It'll also limit the amount of light that's actually coming into your shot. So you've got to be cognizant of that. Um, 3D trees will basically block light. And, you know, I, I do see students do this technique, you know, build up kind of a wall of green but you've got to be mindful that you're going to lose a lot of light in your shot, especially if your main light source is, you know, going to be coming through uh, light through these windows. Be mindful of that. You can actually block a lot of that. The second thing to be mindful of is uh, performance. You can kind of see here, I've got a bunch of broad leaves. I've got a whole bunch of uh, foliage. It's not a crazy amount of foliage, but you can see up here, my poly count, or I think D5 might use triangles, um, I think is what it's going off, um, has like just exponentially shot up. We're just under 8 million right now. And, and that is not a lot of foliage, but it's a pretty heavy um, kind of impact to your scene, especially if you're running, you know, D5 on kind of a, you know, kind of anything lower than my 
current 3070, you, you may struggle. So this is one way to go about doing it. All right, let's go ahead and hide the foliage. The other ways that you can do this involve SketchUp. Okay, here we are in SketchUp. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to unhide a couple of things. The first is this. I'm gonna right click here and unhide, and I'm gonna go ahead and bounce back to D5. Another way that you can hide your horizon line, and you absolutely do wanna hide that horizon line, is a simple and kind of older technique. Basically, from the warehouse in SketchUp, you can just search for backgrounds, and you can see some of them will come in like this. It's a curved image plane with a picture on it that has an opacity map for the sky. Now, these are unbelievably easy to use, um, and they're incredibly lightweight. They won't really affect the poly count. They're not gonna slow anything down. There are a few things that you do need to be aware of, and the big one here is uh, coverage. You can see this plane that I've set up. You have to be very mindful of, is it actually doing a good job of covering the horizon line and giving the impression that your scene is in an actual place or environment? You also have to be kind of mindful that the scene or environment on the picture, the plane here actually matches up to where your interior render is actually supposed to be. So again, you know, if you're doing an, an urban design, it really wouldn't make sense to have just a big giant green field on your projected plane here. So you've got to be a little sort of mindful of that. Now you can also see, I'm going to have to spend quite a bit of time moving this plane around, making sure that it lines up well and that it is in fact actually scaled up correctly. And really importantly, that the perspective actually lines up. So I'm gonna go ahead and just update this here again. We're gonna bounce back into D5 and you can kind of see, okay, yeah, the perspective is looking good. It's giving the impression that our build is maybe up on a hill within the city, which is kind of, kind of fits with the luxury kind of design you're going for. But you can still see, we're gonna to have to keep moving this plane. I might even have to rotate it a little bit and I'm just gonna to have to keep tweaking this. And you know, I haven't found a good way to like do this where it doesn't involve just a huge amount of manual adjustment. Um, and you may think, yeah, that's that's totally fine. Okay, cool. I, I'm, I'm okay tweaking a plane in SketchUp because let's face it, it'll probably be out of focus and really your viewer should not be looking at it anyway. Yeah, this is absolutely a viable way to go. You can still because there's opacity on this plane, you could, you could absolutely like tweak your environment a little bit. Um, and you can see that that will be reflected. Um, you're gonna run into one or two issues, like a nighttime shot with this is just not really going to work because you know if you've got even the slightest amount of environment light, even though it is a nighttime shot, your image plane is still going to actually appear for the most part, kind of lit up the way it would be by default. But that's a whole other thing for you guys to worry about. This is a really efficient and fast way to do it. Last thing I wanna talk about is um, a different technique. I'm gonna go ahead and again, just back in SketchUp, hide this image plane. And I would love to claim credit for this. This is not, uh, I did not come up with this. This is something that Greg Miles from Luminous Labs talked about. And I'm gonna go ahead and unhide this. Um, this is a, a sphere. You can see it's a complete sphere in SketchUp. Um, it has, I think it's double-sided and it has opacity applied to the actual material. And what you're looking at is a HDRI image, the type of thing that you can get from like Polyhaven or really any high resolution HDRI image. Um, and it's just mapped onto this sphere within SketchUp. So you can see now, in SketchUp, it kind of looks a little weird, a little bit janky, but if we go back to D5, yeah, there we go. You can see that we're inside this polysphere. It's got this, I think like 8K, maybe 4K HDRI image texture that's actually mapped to the sphere. And because it's mapped to the sphere outside of your SketchUp model, you can actually select the sphere, you can kind of move it around, you can move it up or down, and you can resize it. You could scale it up and down. The main thing to note with this is you do have to go ahead and select this in D5. 
You will, by default, I think it comes in kind of dark. Uh, you will want to turn on emissive and put that to just a low value. You, you don't want to crank this. I had mine at one. And you do want to go up here to where it says invisible in ray tracing. If you don't have that actually ticked, it acts literally like a 360 degree massive dome that sits around your model. But if you go ahead and just go boop, turn that on, you can see now that D5 will not factor this into the lighting. It acts as really just a projected image. It's not acting as a real HDRI, but it is a sphere that's just projected there. And that I think looks really good as a background. Now, um, I think, you know, this is still gonna be affected by like the exposure values and things like that, I think, but you may wanna kind of figure that one out before. Um, you'll also have to try and find a HDRI that kind of looks legit and works with your scene. And again, um, you may run into some lighting issues with this. You can also use either of these techniques, the plane, the HDRI, and turn on the foliage as well and try and kind of blend between the two. Um, the other thing is, I'm gonna go back to, uh, let me just hide this really quickly. One last thing I wanna talk about on the dreaded horizon line. Let's go back to our view and I'm gonna unhide this, get this artwork and I'm gonna go ahead and again, just unhide the sphere, go ahead and go back to D5 and you'll see. Um, depending on the technique you use, this uh, material is kind of coming in quite reflective. You can see D5 is converted to glass, that's fine but I'm getting a lot of reflections in the background here. The reason for that is because I do not have a back wall here. So you will wanna actually go and unhide everything. If you've got a wall that you've hidden while you were modeling, you do wanna go ahead and unhide that again. And there we go. That should stop any strange reflections or any strange horizon line coming in. You're not gonna get now horizon line reflections uh, showing up in your D5 models. And this is like, you know, I think really, really important. And again, it's one of those weird little things that, you know, beginner mistakes, but it is avoidable. You just gotta be cognizant of what's showing up in your reflections and um, just, you know, do your best to hide that horizon line. Uh, nobody needs to see it. All right, hopefully that should make sense to everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and we're gonna bounce into tip number three. Okay, everyone, tip number three. And again, we're looking at the most common mistakes that I see my students make and the mistakes that I know I absolutely made when I was first starting out. And tip number three is to do with camera positioning and focal length. Okay, so let's go ahead and unhide some decoration. All right, here we've got our room decorated. You can see it's a pretty simple setup. We've got some um, kind of gray fabric furniture. We've got some decorative elements. We've got this marble table, which probably, you know, probably wouldn't do this marble table really with these marble tiles, but whatever. Um, and we've got our artwork on the back wall and we've got these two lamps that we're gonna light up as well. And we've got a little bit of greenery here just to break up the shot. Okay, cool. Everything is ready to go. Now, what I tend to encounter then comes down to camera positioning and focal length. So what I often see in students is misunderstanding where you should place your cameras and what focal length you should be using. I'm gonna bounce over here. So this is sometimes, you know, kind of a camera angle that I, I'm kind of, I do see with my students is something like this. So you can see they're trying to show off the entire room, which is, is fine. That's absolutely totally fine. But you'll actually notice that what they've done is move the camera really, really, really far back, like maybe way too far back. And you'll also notice the focal length. Now, if you're in uh, Twin Motion or Lumion or D5, the focal length slider is gonna be different for all of those programs. But for the most part, when it comes to interiors, 
you want to avoid something that looks a little bit like this. So we have to be mindful of the focal length of our camera. The other shots that I tend to get quite a lot are either excessively zoomed in or they tend to be like really low to the ground uh, or really, really high up. And again, this is under understandable for students starting out. So how do we get around this? Well, quite simply, keeping your camera pretty basic. So I'm gonna go ahead and just position my camera here and I'm gonna go ahead and just reduce the navigation speed in D5 so it doesn't bounce around too much. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and encapsulate all of the shot as best I can. So let's go ahead and just hit update the scene. And then we're gonna to go to our camera and we're going to start manually adjusting the actual focal length. Now, I'm not gonna set up, we're not you know, trying to do anything crazy here. We just kinda of wanna get a nice focal length on the camera that allows us to get all of the scene in. And I think that looks pretty good. Now. We're not concerned about exposure or the lights or the ceiling or anything like that just yet, just setting up our camera. And I think there is a lot more to be said for a very simple, straightforward shot set up well versus trying to do something very, very stylish. Yeah, you could probably do a shot like this and you could probably come in and adjust the focal length and, you know, keep tilting your camera and do a really good job trying to get up, you know, multiple angles. But at the end of the day, um, that just kind of seems unnecessary. Just get a basic camera, but there you go. That'll do a much better job of telling the story and setting up your shot. Okay, um, that's it for tip number three. Just be mindful of where your camera is placed and the focal length. Keep it simple. Okay, on to Tip number four. And tip number four pertains to skies. So here we have, um, just to the right of our original sphere, we just have a house model that I grabbed from the warehouse. And this tip really pertains to exterior renders. Now, a lot of times people starting out, myself included, um, you know, back in the day and my students, find exteriors easier to set up. You don't have to worry as much about complicated lighting. And most rendering software at the moment does a really, really good job of rendering foliage and greenery. And, and so those are in many ways easier to set up. So you may be wondering what the problem is. Well, it comes down to skies. And I am absolutely guilty of this. Um, there's always this desire to have a really dramatic sky in your shots. And so an example of that in D5 would be going to our environment tab, switching to the HDRI, and maybe grabbing something like this. And it's, it's really easy and tempting to do this because there's this belief that by having a dramatic sky is actually going to improve your render. The problem with this is if you combine the really dramatic skies with some of the focal length cameras and some of the camera issues that we just talked about previously, what ends up happening is instead of getting a shot that focuses on the architectural part of your shot, whether that's a house or the build or, you know, your cabin design or whatever it is that you've built, it actually ends up being something more like this, which is not architectural rendering is, and is more like, you know, sky rendering. Uh, students tend to show off the coolest, most dramatic looking sh thing in the shot. And oftentimes that's the sky not necessarily the build. And, you know, this is obviously compounded by students who, you know, don't correctly position their models within the camera or don't do a really good job of lining up the shot and instead, you know, end up with the camera really far back like this. So how we get around this is keep it very, very simple and very basic. There are some amazing uh, default skies within D5, and I think the D5 team is working on getting some new ones for the newer version of D5, which would be, I think, uh, 2.4, I think is what it would be. But really, at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with a simple, straightforward, either cloudy sky like this one, where you've got a little bit of clouds in the sky and you can spin this and adjust this to your heart's content, or just using the geo on sky and turning on clouds and really just messing with these 
and just trying to make it look like something that is natural and organic. At the end of the day, the sky should help your image look better. You're, you're trying to sell a mood or an atmosphere, but you know, it, it shouldn't take away from your actual render. When in doubt, keep it simple, keep it basic. And I think that will help with the skies as well. And that's how you avoid having something like this that looks really, really over the top dramatic. All right, cool. With that said, let's move on to tip number five for most common mistakes. Okay, if you've made it to uh, tip five, thanks for sticking out. Um, I'll make this pretty short. One of the last things that I see um, new students making a sort of mess with is lighting. And we're not gonna go through all the ins and outs of lighting, because I tend to see the one problem reoccurring again and again and again. And this is true of, I think, to my mind, D5, when I first started learning D5, but also true to, you know, Lumion and Twinmotion and a bunch of the other ones. Lights are really, really, really strong. And so when you're first starting out, there's a tendency to be like, okay, I'm doing an interior shot. I need lights. Let me just fill the scene with like tons and tons of lights. And yeah, everything will look awesome. So there's kind of two issues here. The first is, you know, sort of where you get your lighting from. And my preference is to get as much ambient lighting as possible from the actual environment and try and limit the amount of artificial lights. Now, um, I did a whole video on this. It's somewhere on, on the channel if you want to take a look at that, the different lighting setups in uh, D5. And I'm not going to run through all of those, but um, if you can get away with as little as possible artificial lighting, then awesome. It's, it's fine to have a little bit, but you really just want to try and get as much of that lovely ambient light as you can. In this shot, we've got light coming in from the actual environment. And we've turned down the auto exposure a little bit. And I've got basically three, what are these? These are the rectangle lights outside the windows and they're blasting light in. So I'm gonna make sure they're set to a pretty low intensity. Now, the second thing when it comes to lighting is the amount of lights. So if we look up here, oftentimes I'll see students do this, just put like lots and lots and lots and lots of lights up there. And they're really, really strong. And so, it sort of kills the depth in your image. Yeah, you're getting like shadows and stuff, but it looks kind of terrible. So let's do this. Let's reduce the amount of these lights. Let's go ahead and delete these. And I'm gonna go ahead and delete these ones here as well. Let's just cut down the lights. And I, I was absolutely guilty of this. If the lighting didn't look good, the response was to like add more lights, but that's just not really the case. So let's go ahead and select these. And what we're gonna actually do is drop the intensity quite a bit. And what we wanna be sort of looking at here is the shadows. So I'm gonna go back to our stored camera and just looking at the shadows more than anything. And just, okay, let's go ahead and just take these up ever so slightly. We do want a little bit of a spotlight effect and you can really see that kind of on the couch area here, but we just don't wanna blow everything out. Okay. I think that's looking nice. I've also got a rectangle light up here. And what I'm gonna do with this one is I'm gonna change the color to really bright red. Ooh, super bright. And you can see what it's affecting. This is going to add uh, just a lot of sort of ambient light. I'm gonna adjust the attenuation radius. And don't worry too much about the intensity. We're gonna then go ahead and adjust the scale on this one. I'm gonna drag this down. And this is actually a point light. I need this guy to be a rectangle light. I'm gonna place it up there. Yeah, there we go. Change the color back to red, super red. Change the intensity to really high. And I'm gonna then just adjust the size here. So let's go ahead and put this at, uh, let's do 6,000. And 6,000 here, length and width, breadth. So that looks pretty good. Probably a little too large. We could probably put this down to like uh, five and five and there we go and we can see how strong this is and we can see the attenuation radius so now we can drop the intensity really low down and i'm going to change this back to temperature and put it on a little warm 
there we go just add a little warmth back in to the shot and yeah i think all in all with this combined kind of lighting setup we've got a kind of nice sky we've got light coming in from the windows go back to our stored camera and um i think yeah i think all in all that looks good there's some stuff you could definitely tweak with this but when in doubt adding more lights is not necessarily the answer nor is cranking up the lights to be really, really strong. There's obviously some stuff that I want to tweak here, like the exposure value a little bit. And, you know, that's that's just going to be some stuff that you're going to do. Okay, hopefully that uh, kind of gives you an idea of pretty much the top mistakes that I routinely see students make. And hopefully you find that this was useful to you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there for today. Thanks for watching all the way through. Um, and I'll see you in the next video. All right, cheers.